Um, so I'm, I'm so pleased uh, to have my friend, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, uh, Don Graves, um, uh, with us uh, here today. And Don, you know, I was reflecting back um, a few years ago, you were in another role. We were sitting in my office. I was telling you about the office building, how we had acquired it. And uh, you let me go on, and then part of the way through, you interrupted me, and you said, Jesse, my great, great, great grandfather owned the hotel that stood on these grounds, the only black-owned hotel in the city 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. And it's, it's part of your family story. You've talked about it before. I wonder if you could share a few words about, about that family legacy and history. Sure, sure. Th thank you. And, and, and Jesse, thank you for, uh, for having me back. It is wonderful to be uh, back at the, uh, the Just Economy Conference, the, I think the most important conference uh, that goes on in this city. Um, but you're right, the, uh, uh, thank you. That's right, you can play. <laughs> All right. Um, and I'll get to why I think it's the most important conference in a little bit. You'll, you'll, he you'll hear this roundabout way of getting to it. So we all have families, we all have histories, but we d all don't know our, uh, our history, and we don't celebrate our, hist our family history the way that we should. Um, it just so happens that my four times great-grandparents were slaves. Uh, they had been freed, and they found themselves in Washington, D.C., as a lot of, uh, of freed blacks uh, did back in the, in the day. They came from the South uh, to D.C. to start a new life. They started a small business. It ended up being a, it was a taxi business, a, a hat carriage business. Uh, so they had their buggy and their horses, and they bought a piece of land because they needed to stable their horses and, and raise a family. The piece of land that they bought is today uh, exactly where the U.S. Department of Commerce sits. So it's a, an interesting, for me, a very interesting through line that I'm running the department or helping to run the department uh, where, my, where my ancestors started their business. Now their son, uh, three times great-grandfather, James Wormley, was an entrepreneur, just like many of us. I, I'm a, 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 a former entrepreneur. Um, and he decided he was going to start some, uh, basically some inns. He, he, he bought some houses and started uh, renting them out. And uh, he eventually bought a building uh, that uh, he turned into a hotel. And it was the premier hotel, not just in Washington, D.C., but it was the premier hotel in the entire United States. And members of Congress, governors, uh, Civil War uh, soldiers, you, you name it, they all patronized his hotel. That hotel sits on the site uh, of the building where NCRC's headquarters currently exists. Um, his son ended up being the very first graduate of, of Howard University, a, 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 a class of, of one. Um, But the most poignant part about it, you can say, oh, that's all, that's great, wow, we, you, you know about your history, it's a, it, it, but the thing that I, I think is most important about it is that is what happened uh, in 1877 in the parlor of the hotel where NCRC sits, and it gets back to why this is so, the conference is so important, and I, I'm gonna apologize because I'm gonna get choked up talking about this. So I told you that Members of Congress met they regularly. They stayed in, in his hotel. They didn't get a, not all of them got apartments they, they, or, you know, let rooms in, in, in houses. They stayed in, in the hotel. So you'll remember the, the, uh, the election back then. That was Rutherford B. Hayes uh, was the Republican at the time uh, who was, was running against the, the Democrat. And I, I can't remember uh, right now. Uh, who the Democrat was, but uh, you'll also remember the parties were flipped back then. Um, and they worked out a compromise, the, the, uh, the legislators, where they would put Rutherford B. Hayes in the presidency, but they would end Reconstruction in the South. So what does that mean? That means decades and decades and decades of Jim Crow which led to the systemic racism that we still feel today, led to the Home Ownership Loan Corporation in the, in 
the early 1930s and the 1935 survey that led to, uh, to the maps that led to redlining. So when you think about our history, remember, you have to take it all. It's not just the good things. Yes, I had ancestors and I am able to trace my history and know about all the things that they were able to do despite the challenges. But it's also the bad things that, that happen and that are still happening and that we have to fight for every day. The systemic racism that has led to challenges across our country that's preventing so many entrepreneurs, people with good ideas like my three times great grandfather who not only ran a hotel but was also one of the very first black patent holders. But imagine all of the millions of kids across this country who have great ideas who can't turn those ideas into lives of dignity because they don't have the opportunity because of the challenges that they face on a daily basis. So that's why this conference is so critical for our country, for the people in every one of our communities across the country. So thank you for what you do. You, you know, I'm so glad you, you told that history, Don, because, um, you know, you can fast forward to today and uh, the racial wealth gap as well as the gender gap um, can, continues to be a significant issue in the U.S. And, and I think when you hear our history told, sometimes it's like, well, there was slavery and then sort of <laughs> civil rights movement. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and, and really what you're getting at is... Um, E even if uh, you know the legal owning of people in the form of slavery was ended, uh, we saw all kinds of policies that were really about controlling and exploiting people, labor, um, and land in, in ways that were deeply unfair. And I think that history, that history of, of ending of Reconstruction uh, r really gets at it. But, but to fast forward to today, um, you know, what policies or initiatives is the Department of Commerce pursuing to work on this issue uh, and promote economic equity for communities of color and underrepresented members of the American workforce? It, it is a great question, and how much time do you have today? <laughs> um, so we all know that this has been um, a challenge that the country has faced, and you can, you can look at it from uh, one perspective where it's, it's been a winner-take-most approach um, where the haves continue to reap the benefits and the have-nots don't have the opportunity to even realize that they're missing out on, uh, on opportunities. Um, one of the things that we're doing uh, that is different from the past is thinking about a new industrial strategy, one that recognizes that there are uh, systemic challenges that are going on that uh, really uh, questions the way that we've done things and forces folks to work in different ways. So you may ask, what's he, what's he talking about? So let's think about the ways that economic development, for instance, and community devel development has happened previously. Think about uh, the Amazon HQ2 race. That's, because that's what it was. It was like, who can throw the most money, the most incentives at Amazon so that they can build a headquarters and maybe create a, a few jobs? Or I think about Foxconn in Wisconsin. Basically, it was a race to the bottom of who can, who can spend the most money to attract a company that would say that they were going to build something and bring some jobs. That's not the way that we are building um, our economic strategy for the, for the future. Our industrial strategy right now has to be place-based. It has to be one where we're holding folks accountable. It has to be one where we are uh, forcing uh, the applicants for these resources, and I'll get into the programs in just a second, for uh, asking them to show us, show, d don't just tell us what you're going to do, show us how you're going to do it. And this is something that, that I know NCRC has done for a very, very, very long time, thinking about things like community benefits plans. That's essentially what we're trying to do. Is So you have historic programs, the American Rescue Plan, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. We have never seen the likes of these programs in uh, most of our lives, maybe 
uh, a few folks uh, saw some of this out of the Great Depression with the New Deal, but it's unlikely that we're ever going to see these types of programs again. Almost $4 trillion worth of investments uh, at one time to rebuild our infrastructure, to rebuild our communities, to uh, build pathways to the future. So I'm, let me go into a, a few of these very, very quickly. Um, the Chips and Science Act. So many of you have heard about this. It's the, uh, the m most of it is focused on rebuilding our semiconductor industry. We know that we need semiconductors because we use them in our cell phones, we use them in our appliances, in our cars, in our equipment, in our businesses. All of us need them, and we only produce 12% of the ch world's chips here in the U.S., none of the most advanced chips. Great, so we're gonna focus on investing so that we can build more of these plants here in the U.S. But how we invest, where we invest, the ways that we get companies to invest and crowd in private capital is critical. We can do it one way where we just throw dollars out to support uh, uh, these fabrication facilities, or we can say, we will give you an investment, but you have to show us how you're gonna get private capital also to the table, how you're going to uh, build a plan that supports workforce development, that creates pathways to folks who don't have opportunities, that incorporates uh, uh, not just the local community, so I'm not to pick on Intel, but it's, it's an easy one for me because I'm an Ohioan. They're building a $20 billion uh, fabrication facility outside of Columbus. It's actually, in a, it, it's a green field, it's a, it's a farming community. They're gonna uh, wipe that farming community out basically and build a new fabrication facility. Well, how are you gonna get folks in Columbus connected to that farming, uh, that, that fabrication facility out in, in rural part of, uh, of Ohio? How are you also going to connect to the suppliers, the manufacturers, the broader ecosystem in Akron, in Youngstown, in Cleveland, in Toledo, in Dayton, and in Detroit, and Pittsburgh, and Indianapolis, and East St. Louis? How are you going to do that? So that's one of the things that this administration is doing, is holding, is getting them to provide us with their plan. And if they can show that they can do all of this in a reasonable way, and that they include local communities and organizations in their plan, then maybe they can get some of this funding. But if they can't do that, why should they get any of the funding? Similarly, we have other programs like our Build Back Better Regional Challenge, our uh, Good Jobs Challenge, now our Tech Hubs program, uh, and our Recompetes program. These are all through our Economic Development Administration, all focused on building pathways, on making sure that we have roadmaps that include local communities, that include uh, community leaders, that include local uh, community development, economic development organizations, that, uh, that include universities, community colleges, training uh, uh, centers, and unions into everything that we do because it's, it's critically important. If we don't build in a comprehensive, holistic way, if we don't have the plan, if we don't see the roadmap, then we're not going to be able to build the types of, uh, of communities and economic opportunity that we all need. Probably more than I, sh I should have no. thrown out, but, but no. I know you would get and it, I, uh, Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. And, and, and Don, how do you think about, you know, all of that in the context of inequality? You, you know, one of the things that, you know, the COVID pandemic really hit uh, black communities, minority communities, underserved communities hardest. As Jelani Cobb was here yesterday and, and, he, and he said, uh, well, in his words, he said, how'd the virus know where the hood was? Um, and, and the point was really obviously uh, not that that's true, but, but that um, communities that, that are uh, vulnerable to begin with are often the first impacted, right. um, the most impacted. Um, and so in the context of, of infrastructure, in the context of thinking about an industrial policy, um, how do we think about the problem 
of inequality in that context? How do we uh, create jobs locally um, right. that, that are not just in a place, but also that sort of equally benefit um, underserved communities in those places? Well, I don't have to tell you all the, the numbers. I don't have to tell you all the, the challenge that we have um, in communities. I mean, think about our, uh, our business community and that 25% of the, uh, the gap in inequality is as a result of the gap in between uh, the majority businesses and, uh, and black and brown businesses. So the, the challenge that we face whether it's, uh, uh, well, and, and, and let me throw one other number out at you because this is important. This is not about, this is, this is not just about uh, doing good uh, because we have to do good and because some of us uh, uh, feel like uh, it's, it's important. This is about economic opportunity. This country, if we had that gap in business opportunities erased. This is, the, this is the Fed. This is not some crazy left-wing outfit. I won't name any left-wing outfits. Um, but the, the Fed says that we would have $6 trillion more in our economy if we could eliminate that gap just with our businesses. And the Kellogg Foundation has found that if we could eliminate systemic uh, inequities, we could grow our economy by, I think it's 2050, by $8 trillion. So when you're talking about a 22 or $23 trillion economy, $8 trillion is not chump change. That's meaningful for every part of this country. So what we're trying to do is take a very systemic approach to eliminating these, these inequities through industrial strategy and the like. I'll give you one example. Um, a lot of people paid attention to the the billions and billions of dollars that's going out as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, a massive program that is going to change our communities in ways that, uh, that I don't even think all of us recognize at this point. But the thing that no one paid attention to, except for those of us at the Commerce Department, was that it created statutory authority for the one agency in the entire federal government that's focused on the support, the long-term success, of minority businesses and other disadvantaged businesses. That's the Minority Business Development Agency. It's been around since Nixon. It was created in, in an executive order. But every year, it has to be reappropriated. And, and, uh, and you know the last administration kept zeroing out that, that budget. Thankfully, our friends in, uh, in Congress kept fighting for it. Well, now we have statutory authority. So not only is it. That's exactly right. Not only is this organization here to stay, but it has the mandate, not just the, something that we're, we're hoping to do, but the mandate to go to every single department in the federal government and say, what is your plan for utilization of minority businesses and other disadvantaged businesses? We want to see your plan. Don't just tell, you, tell us what you're going to do. Show us the plan. And then we're going to say, OK. We think you need to change it, and they have to make some changes based on, on that, uh, that uh, 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 sharing of the plan. Then, not only are we going to ask you to tell us what you're going to do and show us what you're going to do, but then prove it over time. We are going to keep track of your, uh, your performance. We want to see the dollars. Show us where the money is going. So we're going to track them, and this is all part of our mandate. This isn't Don saying something I want to do. Yes, it's something I want to do. But we are going to track it. And then we're going to be able to go back and say, well, you didn't perform. And more importantly, the companies and, and grantees that said they were going to do something didn't perform. So we can hold them accountable. Again, something that, uh, that Jesse, I know you, you know uh, all about. So it's these types of, of efforts uh, that I think are going to be a game changer for communities uh, of color. And so we're doing this all across the federal government, uh, whether it's the, the, our efforts with, uh, with, uh, with Justice 40, our efforts uh, in building equity. The president has signed, I think it's eight executive orders on equity, um, all focused on making sure that we're creating opportunities for all Americans. And that's, that's something that we did at the Department of Commerce. We changed the mission of the Department of Commerce. 
The, the mission was to create economic uh, growth and, and, comp uh, uh, and competitiveness in the United States. I, I may be off a little bit on the, uh, on the exact language, but what we did was we added three words at the end of the mission for all communities because we are the Department of Communities and People, not the Department of Business. And, and Don, you know, I think a lot of people don't really know all of the things the Department <laughs> of Commerce does, and it turns out you do many diverse things. Uh, it, you know, you, you have jurisdiction over NOAA, um, the, the National Oceanic... And Atmospheric Administration. And Atmospheric Administration. Uh, but you also play a really important role in data, and um, you know part of this too. I think you cited some statistics in terms of the the wealth loss, the GDP loss in the economy because of inequality. Um, you know, it's estimated that we'll be a non-majority minority uh, society within 20 years. A hundred percent of the net new household formation um, over the next 20 years will be people of color. Um, those are the future home buyers of America. But we also know that, that women and, and uh, minorities are starting businesses at a faster rate. And, and so you play a really important role in terms of the census mm -hmm. and generally on data, issues like data privacy, cybersecurity, and, and the role of technology uh, in, in, in the economy. What, you know, what is the Department of Commerce doing around these issues? Really, uh, first of all, sort of tracking the data that helps us know and understand what's going on demographically um, and, and, and with our country and then, and then secondarily like this threat um, of, of cyber security, right. how other people are using data um, of their own accord um, to, to really threaten and harm people. So um, it's, it's a great question. Let me quickly in 15 seconds or 30 seconds tell you what the Department of Commerce is. So we're the, uh, I talked about the Minority Business Development Agency, the Economic Development Administration, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which includes the National Weather Service. That's our climate data uh, agency for the entire federal government. Census Bureau, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which, by the way, is connecting every household, every family, every street, every community in the country with high-speed internet that is affordable. We're, we're doing that. It, it includes the Bureau of Industry and Security, the International Trade Administration, uh, the National uh, Technical Information Service. Anyway. Just a few things. Just a few things going on. But to your point, Census, BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, and NOAA, and other parts of the department are focused on data because Information, as you all know, is power. And the way that we track information, the way that we use information is absolutely critical. So um, in addition to trying to make sure that uh, in the next decennial census, uh, which ha will be here in no time, that we are adequately uh, uh, counting every single individual in this country, in every community, not just some communities, we're also thinking about the ways that we share data, that, uh, that we use data in all of our programs. In fact, um, our, uh, our, the undersecretary who leads both B, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis and Census has built a, uh, is building a new effort focused on how we uh, do regional economic development which I think would be a great uh, tool for many of you in the work that, that you're doing so you can see the impact of programs and see how it's affecting people directly. The NOAA is tracking climate data and the impact, working with HUD, working with Transportation and the, and the Department of Energy, working to track the, on the impact of climate on communities of color. <coughs> for, thank you. For, for instance, we now have a new program that's, uh, I think last summer it was operating in about a dozen cities. I think we're expanding it this upcoming summer. Tracking heat impact, it's heat mapping. So the impact that heat has in our urban cores in particular on especially people of color and, 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 uh, and underserved communities. 
because we know it has a dispor disproportionately harmful impact on those communities. Anyway, these are all the things that, that, that we're doing. Tracking data is absolutely critical. It helps us uh, build out the science and then make programs that are science-based and that recognize that equity uh, and inclusivity have to be at the core of everything that we do. Thank you, John, and, 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 and it's so fascinating. I just do want to give a shout out to uh, one of our researchers, Dr. Bruce Mitchell, who wrote his thesis on on the effect of, of uh, really urban heat concentrations, the effect on health. Um, I talked last night about you know how our issues really interconnected. We have to think not just about redlining in terms of the bank, but really redlining uh, in terms of land use policy, right. the impact right. that it has right. on people. Uh, a lot of uh, communities of color were, were built with more concrete and less trees, um, leading to, to, to greater levels of heat, um, which, which has an impact on health. No question. Last question, Don. I remember um, you, know, you were chair of, of the uh, transition team for, uh, for the Treasury and, um, and uh, bank regulatory agencies, and I remember you know, we were talking then, and, and you're like, well, you know, the president might want me to do this, might want me to do that. I think, I think commerce was kind of, there was kind of a list of things. It was like, and maybe commerce. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and obviously, given your background and history, there's, there's a real natural connection there. But is, is there anything you've learned uh, that you really didn't know or didn't appreciate um, a, a, about the Department of Commerce uh, before you took the job? Uh, the Department of Commerce is probably the most important department that folks don't normally think about. It's, uh, everyone thinks about Treasury. Treasury is a fantastic uh, department, a lot of power, a lot of tools. You can do a lot to support communities uh, and, and if you build these tools the right way. But the Department of Commerce is underappreciated, but it's at the core of the President's agenda right now. As you think about industrial policy, you think about supply chains, you think about the challenges that we face uh, around the globe from our adversaries, uh, you think about the rise of AI, everyone's been paying attention to, uh, to AI, chat GBT and the, and the like. We're the ones who, uh, who actually work on, uh, on artificial intelligence, quantum computing and the like. Um, so there are so many tools at the Department of Commerce that I'm learning still, even two plus, well, two years into this, I'm still learning every day something that I didn't know about it before. But how we harness those tools, I think the Department of Commerce is the, is the agency that can have the most impact on the communities that you all represent and serve uh, because we have all these different tools all in one place. So if we do this the right way, if we partner with you all, and that's something that I've made as a top priority is partnering with stakeholders that the department hasn't always listened to, we can actually have a massive impact to be a more competitive country, to create opportunities uh, for everyone in every corner of the country, not just some co corners of the country. Wonderful. Another round of applause uh, for the Deputy Secretary. Thanks so much Thanks, for being here. Thank you.